Aha. There's always a delay with this live stream. Never quite launches, at least on my end, I can't see it right away. All right, let's get into the news. Um, the news is at least some exciting news since last week, um, last week's recording. The exciting thing, at least the small exciting thing, is we now have little Tony the turtle here. Um, is a fun little lamp that I have added to the uh, office to replace our current lamp, which is illuminating the room right now. So Tony, Tur Tony the turtle, uh, fun addition. Other exciting news is I know I look like a crazy person with um, hand-drawn notes here. Uh, but I'm sketching out some route plans. Um, just had a board meeting the other day with Stewards of Historical Preservation, of, of which I am a board member. And I had briefly mentioned, I think last week, um, we were working on a fundraiser or an idea for doing a, a century, which is 100 miles on a bike. But I think what we talked about in the board meeting was having this done through Stewards of Historical Preservation rather than my, my channel. And um, what we'll probably end up doing is bike tours on the towpath. Um, and I've started sketching out some routes. I mean, ideally, I would have liked to bike a century. Maybe I will this summer. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I still want to call it the Time Traveler Tour. Um, maybe even the Time Traveler Trivia Tour. One of the potential routes that I developed was... Oh, I know. I swear I, I don't look this kooky. Um, aha, here it is. It's just, it was easier for me to sketch out these on little sheets of paper. But I had an idea for the Time Traveler tour trivia tour. And the idea behind it was you'd bike 50 miles and um, you have, let's see, I think nine stops along the way. And e at each of the stops, you have to answer five trivia questions. The idea is 50 miles, 50 trivia questions. The person who completes the 50 miles and gets the most trivia questions right wins. I mean, it was just a hypothetical idea. It's probably a bit too complicated, logistically speaking. I think it sounds like a fun idea, but I think trying to get people to race on the towpath is probably not advisable. Um, although I do like the idea of uh, combining these two into a time traveler trivia tour, just because it's alliterative and it's fun that way. But I do have some routes uh, planned. I've got to run them by the board. Um, we'll see if we can't start organizing things as that develops. Obviously, I'm going to share that news. If you want to stay up to date, I highly recommend you check out Stewards of Historical Preservation. Uh, they've got a Facebook or a Facebook page, and at least in the next month, there's going to be a brand new website launch because um, <clears throat> we, or at least we, the 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 nonprofit because I'm on the board, uh, got I guess a grant from Triad, um, which is a graphic design company, to design a new website. So they're going to have a new website rollout. So check out Stewards of Historical Preservation for any updates that are coming down the pipeline on the Time Traveler Tour. Um, and also, you'll probably hear commentary or news and updates about it on my Telegram channel. Um, so you can check out the Telegram channel by, I believe, I'm trying to think about this from the viewer's perspective. I believe when you're on my channel homepage, there's all those little those little icons, those little blurbs, um, you know, you've got the banner for the channel and then you've got like the, the, um, itch.io, uh, logo. You've got the, uh, telegram logo. You've got the, oh, I think I have a Twitch logo. Uh, and then I think there's the anchor.fm logo. So then you can listen to the podcast there. Um, go to the telegram channel. And then if you start following the telegram channel, you'll get, you know, I, I don't post there crazy. I'm not, I'm, it's not Twitter. It's, it's not, I don't tweet. Um, man, I'm starting to sound old here, aren't I? Um, but, you know, from time to time, probably once, maybe twice a week, I'll send out something on Telegram updating everyone about, like, you know, how the podcast is developing, upcoming episodes, upcoming events, um, things like that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention in the news and updates section, which you don't get in the recorded uh, version of the podcast, so if you listen on Spotify or whatever, you don't get this. Uh, you only get this on the um, live stream, uh, is... I'm currently working with a landowner right now that may be in the vicinity of, man, I don't know what I did to my throat this morning, <clears throat> but it feels a little scratchy. Hopefully it doesn't sound scratchy. <clears throat> anyway, 
Um, I'm working with a landowner right now um, in the Cuyahoga Falls region, um, which may potentially uh, be on the same location as the settlement from the 1750s of Chief Hopokan. You may know him as Captain Pipe. Uh, there's a statue of him in Barberton, Ohio. Um, but essentially, there's just loose maps that kind of document where this settlement was, but we don't really have any concrete archaeological evidence demonstrating where that settlement is. And so because this landowner lives very near those those mapped areas, uh, we're probably going to do some geophysical survey and some limited excavation on their property. I have very, very low hopes, so like I'm not trying to hype this up as like, oh, we're going to find you know Captain Pipe's village. That's not... I, I mean, that'd be cool if we found parts of it, but... <clears throat> realistically i don't think we're going to find anything at all i think i think the best case scenario would be we find a flake or two and then we find some marbles and some broken bottle glass and that kind of stuff but you know you don't know until you you investigate and you survey so that's coming up that'll probably be in about three or four weeks so i'll probably do maybe a live stream of that stuff and then i'll probably also do a couple of recorded uh and edited videos to document what we were doing at the site and catching people up to speed so then they can sort of see what archaeology looks like in action um, and kind of stay up to date on that stuff. So again, you'll be able to follow that along the YouTube channel, but also on the Telegram channel to get updates on that stuff as well. So with all that news out of the way, let's go ahead and get started on this week's episode. All right. Hey there, bibliophiles, and welcome to another episode of From the Archives a book review podcast where I talk about a book from my library and whether you should or shouldn't read it. I'm Eric, a professor of anthropology at Cuyahoga Community College, and welcome to my library. The books in my library are sometimes old, sometimes rare, sometimes normal, but always interesting. And this podcast is recorded live on YouTube at Anthropology Archives every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Every episode, I ask myself the following questions. Who wrote it? What's it about? What are other people saying about it? Should you read it? And whether I should can it or keep it, chuck it or cherish it, reread or recycle, shelve it or shove it, jettison or set it in. Uh, these are all fun terms to say, should you have it on the bookshelf? Um, since I'm pulling them from my bookshelf, do I want to keep them? Um, all that said, uh, let's go ahead and pull this week's book from the shelf. And I have since stopped actually pulling them from the shelf just for brevity's sake and also just it's i mean this week we're talking about multiple books let's put it that way we've got one two three four five different books that we're talking about this week because this week we are talking about atlases yes unfortunately it's pronounced or spelled atlases and not atli i mean i think it, i think that's a missed opportunity really um you know, atli sounds cooler. It also kind of sounds like atlatl, which is the Nahuatl word for a spear thrower. Um, I mean, for that fun fact, if you ever wanted to know, atl, 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 atlatl. So atli just sounds sort of like a in the same vein. But we've got some books to talk about here, and they are atlases. To surprise, no surprise there. We've got the Northeastern Tour Book of the. Uh, American Automobile Association, AAA, for those that probably might still have it. I don't know. AAA is not exactly as big as they used to be. This is from 1939. It's it's a beast. And actually, you know what? I didn't even realize it's got a bunch of fun maps at the end, too, that I have not actually um, checked out. Um, but this thing is like 400 plus pages. So there's that book. We'll give it a little sound here. So there's the tour book. We've got the Pocket World Atlas 5th edition uh, from the Oxford Press. This one is from, I believe, uh, oh, the tour book, I, I didn't say it already, was from 1939. I can't remember if I already said that. Uh, the Oxford World book is from 2005, uh, Pocket Atlas. We've got the Scholastic Atlas of the World, which is from 2001, and it's, you know, coffee table sized. And it's a bit thinner than the other ones. Uh, and it's like 230-ish pages. We've got... Now, this one's off the walls, but it's to be expected. I, you know, the the brand we're calling this is Anthropology Archives. Um, so, you know, and I teach anthropology. So, of course, I have a book on Cahokia, 
the largest prehistoric city in native North America. Um, the Cahokia Atlas from 1997. This is the revised edition by Melvin Fowler. Um, I'll have some things to say about that. And then the last book we are talking about today is The World Through Maps, A History of Cartography by John Rennie Short. And this is from 2003. And it's about... Oh, oh I didn't mention the page numbers of the um, Cahokia Atlas, but it's got to be it's got to be like 300 something yeah 260 it's about the same for uh john rennie shorts um the world through maps so those are our books that we're talking about today so why why have atlases first i guess we should get that question out of the way i mean why i mean obviously obviously i have atlases at lie um and i find them useful but i don't find them useful as necessarily reference material in of themselves obviously like if i want to know where you know djibouti is ha 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 i said djibouti um or if i want to know where uh, cameroon is um i can obviously google those right so at least from a geographic standpoint um knowing where the location of specific things are on the globe i don't really see a whole lot of value in owning a physical atlas for that purpose um, especially for navigation when people have smartphones that's not why I would argue you should have an atlas. You should probably have an atlas um, for you know your own, I guess you could say, critical thinking and um, enhancing of your knowledge. So continuing education. Um, I know I'm such a terrible you know educator who constantly thinks that people should just have these things as good general reference. Um, and that's why I think I probably want to start with talking about uh, the world through maps. Um, this one of the uh, books that we're talking about today is the one that I thoroughly enjoyed the most. Um, I found the world through maps to be a pleasant surprise um, because it uh, it covers the history of cartography. Go figure! Um, but it doesn't just talk about like Europeans or anything like that. It talks about different traditions. So oh oh my goodness! As the book uh, falls right on top of the camera there. <laughs> um. <laughs> keep things exciting right uh so there we go we've adjusted ourselves uh so he talks about the history of like hunter gatherer maps he has a whole chapter on aboriginal um australian map making and how different it looks pictographic maps rock art so really as an archaeologist i found it kind of refreshing to look at the history of cartography not just as hey let's talk about some old maps from like the 1400s kind of thing but we're going to talk about the concept of map making the concept of projections, uh, orientation. So it wasn't just about the history of map making, but also basic cartographic principles. And honestly, you know, I thought it was pretty good uh, for a primer. Like if I was, you know, I, I, I do teach archaeology classes. And since I don't have the opportunity to incorporate a lot of cartography or geography lessons into class, I think this would be a great sort of read through this and you'll have a lot of good basic understandings that would prime you for classes where it's not the focus um sort of like archaeology like you know in an ideal world i'd have all my students uh take a class on cartography maps and map reading before they even take any of my archaeology classes even intro um just because we inherently deal with maps like every week of class in archaeology um but you know that's not how the the way the world works is so I would think a book like this, like I could assign it to a student who's like coming into my field methods class in the summer and say, hey, maybe go read this book. Um, it's going to give you a great primer on the topic. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be interesting. It's not just going to be about, um, you know, uh, like grid lines, longitude, latitude. It's not just going to be about map projections. It's also going to be about interesting things like uh, um, pictographic maps or talking about rock art in maps so really getting you to think outside the box and think about different cultural perspectives on map making and obviously the implications of design so there are a few things in there that i thought were really interesting uh, talking about um, the use of shading and color that can really alter your perception of a map i think one of the the best examples of that was um Oh, here it is. Maps as propaganda, like a whole section on maps as propaganda. And the example that um, uh, Dr. Short gives is South Africa um, being shaded black versus the rest of um, Africa being shaded white. 
and then flipping it so that South Africa is shaded black and the rest of Africa is shaded white. And basically showing that if you were to uh, show the majority of you know, the continent of Africa as shaded black, and then having South Africa being white, it's unbalanced and it looks unstable. Whereas having the single country shaded black and then the rest of it shaded white uh, makes it look more stable. So thing, subtle things like that that I had learned through trial and error uh, working in geographic information systems and making maps in archaeology, having no sort of like geographic formal training. I mean, I've taken geography classes, sure. Um, so it just was something that I hadn't really thought about in a minute. And it was kind of refreshing to see that in a book about the history of cartography. So I kind of enjoyed that. Um, and I will circle back to this book when talking about um, the reviews that people had for this book. Because there were some really critical reviews of this book. And I couldn't quite understand why they were so critical. But um, that's the world through maps. My rating of that book is 5 out of 5. I would say of the books that I'm talking about today... This is definitely the one that I would recommend people read, um, even if they don't have a great understanding of geography or cartography, because it will provide enough context and information for you that I think it's approachable and will provide a lot of good general background information. Um, and again, usually when I try to give something a five out of five stars, my interpretation is this is a general, everyone should probably read it if they can, because I think it's a general knowledge builder. Um, Whereas sometimes I've given five out of fives just because I found them to be fantastic books, but I'm trying to be cautious. I don't want to give everything a five out of five that I thought was a great book just for me. I want to give it a five out of five because I think it's a book that everyone can approach uh, and gain something from. Uh, unless you're a snooty map collector like some of the people who reviewed this book. Um, but we'll get into that. Now, talking about the Cahokia Atlas, sort of shifting gears here, is a very different type of atlas. Um, this one is definitely one of those cases of this is not replaced by Google Maps. There's no way you're going to be able to get the Cahokia Atlas and supplement any of the information within this book uh, via Google Maps because the information in the Cahokia Atlas is about archaeological excavations, the locations of earthworks, um, of platform mounds. Um, for context, Cahokia is a very large um, prehistoric city, uh, roughly dates from 900. 950 CE to about the 1400s in terms of its peak and during that time period there were about 20-ish thousand people that lived in Cahokia like downtown Cahokia and this is um, east of St. Louis. I actually got an opportunity to visit Cahokia recently um, because it was outside and it was one of the few few little trips that I could take where I didn't have to worry about being in a crowded space with a mask on or anything like that. Um, and it was really interesting seeing Cahokia and reading the Cahokia Atlas in advance of going to Cahokia really helped me understand the context of the site because it's been really altered um, by urbanization. Obviously, it's on the other side of the river from St. Louis. I mean, there's a highway that's literally splicing through part of the site. I mean, it's also a very large city, so it's it's not I don't mean to sound like we should be. Um, that shocked that a, that a highway and multiple roads and businesses are on top of things. I mean, it's unfortunate. Like if this were Tenochtitlan or Teotihuacan in, in Mexico, those sites are protected tooth and nail and, and you can't build anything on top of them. Um, but, you know, that's that's a whole nother discussion about the history of um, American archaeology and um, preservation of cultural resources in the United States. But point being, if you're at all interested in that time period of Native North America and you want to learn about the largest city in prehistory in North America, the continent, then I definitely recommend checking out the Cahokia Atlas. Um, lots of really neat maps, a lot of detailed information. I will say it's a bit dry. I wouldn't necessarily say this is a page turner in the sense of I should read it like a cover to cover thing. Probably just pick out the things that you really are interested in and maybe, you know, if you're someone who lives in the St. Louis area or does research on the late prehistoric, this is something very useful to have. At least I would think so. Even though it's from 1997 and things have been updated, um, the broad brushstroke stuff hasn't changed much. I mean, unless they start excavating more of, say, Monk's Mound, which is an artist rendition of Monk's Mound, appears on the front. Um, it's about a 150-foot tall mound. I mean, it's gigantic. It's very impressive uh, to see in person. Um, and they've done excavations since you know, 97 of Monk's Mound, but um, 
for the most part, the layout of Cahokia has not completely changed in the last 25 years since this book was revised. So the Cahokia Atlas, definitely worth looking into, but because it's so niche, I can't give it anything higher than like a three out of five, um, just because this is not something that everyone needs to read. But if this is this is your jam, then definitely check it out. Now the Scholastic Atlas of the World um, and the Pocket Atlas of the World, I'm just gonna talk about them in tandem, uh, just because I think these fall into the category of atlases or atli that can date themselves very quickly. Uh, I think they're really fun to look at. I just thoroughly enjoy flipping through and looking at maps, sort of like when we talked about coffee table books, like the idea of just, I mean, it's all about the pictures and looking at stuff and not necessarily about um, reading anything. Um, and I think that's where these two books kind of fall short for me. And that's why I have to give them two out of five. Uh, I mean, they get the job done. They give you some spatial awareness of things. If you're, you know, need a map of the city of Berlin, it doesn't do a great job in the pocket atlas. I um, mean, it gives you a sliver of it. Um, and then the Scholastic Atlas of the World, I think it just dates itself by providing too much information that's going to be outdated 20 years later. Like 2001 to 2021, the population estimates they have here, I mean, Kosovo didn't exist in 2001. Um, so national borders, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, demographic stuff. They have stuff in here like life and expectancy by country in the Scholastic Atlas of the World. So I found it really interesting. Obviously, I had this book when I was younger. So, you know, like a, a you know, middle schooler or someone who's younger who just needs a good atlas to, as a reference point um, to get them interested in jumping into the topic, I think is a great reference point for that. Also, takes away the strain on the eyes. That would be the one, I guess, plus side is... We spend so much time on screens. It was actually nice getting ready for this episode to sit down and just flip through these these atlases um, and not have to stare at a screen um, because I end up looking at Google Maps all the time. Like, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'll just Google locations just because I'm curious about the physical location of spots. And I could spend like a whole hour just like, you know, scrolling around Google Maps, looking at all these different things on the map and whatnot. But it was nice to be able to do that without having to strain my eyes and continuing to look at a screen and all the health benefits that people tell us are bad about looking at screens. I'm sure we'll learn about that when we're in our 70s and we're all blind or have glaucoma or something of that sort. Um, and we're going deaf because we have headphones in all the time. But the point is, I don't think these atlases are the kinds of atlases that I would say you want to keep on your bookshelf because... Like I said, these atlases are from an era when the internet just wasn't at the capacity it is now. So their 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 day in the sun is over, um, at least for the the general public. Whereas, you know, Cahokia Atlas and the world through maps, uh, you know, they provide something that just a simple Google search can't really provide. Um, and that's why I would say they are more interesting and, and keepable in that regards. So keeping those ones. And then the last one, so here's our here's our sometimes old and sometimes rare, is the 1939 uh, Northeastern Tour book. So basically what this is, is think of this like um, a combination atlas, but also like describing um, sort of like in our coffee table books uh, episode, uh, how there was the Treasures of America. And it was basically like where to drive and, and, and check out locations, what to do, like hotels. Basically, this was written by the Automobile Association of America, which was formed in, I think, 1902. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, you know, giving you information about various states in the Northeast. So from Illinois to um, New England, and then I think as far south as Kentucky is in here. Um, and it, and it gives you a fun little map of each of the, the cities, like here's Indianapolis from 1939. So I think it's really cool in that regard because it's giving you a little snapshot of what, what I guess you could say someone in 1939 would have experienced if they were driving around. But really, in my opinion, um, oh, I had it bookmarked here. The thing that stood out to me was just learning about, um, cars from you know the early 20th century i i knew that this was pre-1950s and um for those that don't know the history of like transportation in the united states the eisenhower administration in the 1950s that's when we kick-started a lot of highway construction um and a lot of the highways that we drive on today were built between the 1950s and the 1970s and so because of that 
you actually had a lot of country roads. So if you've ever been on a country road or a, a state route or anything like that, that's like two lanes with the double yellow lines, that was basically what the main highway system was prior to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s for most of the United States. And if you really want to insight into that and why highways in you know post-World War II America were such a big deal, this page 339 here, <clears throat> the Digest of State Motor Vehicle Laws, and just right here, we've got Connecticut through West Virginia here. Um, looks like Virginia is also included in the Northeast. Um, Ohio, represent, is also in here. Um, maximum driving speeds is 45. It, District of Columbia, the max speed is 30. Um, max speed in Vermont is 50 miles an hour. Um, Ohio, it's 45, at least in 1939. And then they have all this inf interesting information that like seems kind of weird to us today, like reciprocity for non-residents. What they mean by that is, you know, when people started driving and they started getting driver's license, states wouldn't honor other people's driver's license. So if you had an Ohio driver's license, that wasn't good in any other state than Ohio. So if you cross the state borders into Indiana or Pennsylvania, then you could actually get in trouble like a misdemeanor or whatnot for driving without a license in the state of Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania didn't honor Ohio's driver's licenses. And then they like list, you know, is reciprocity a thing? Uh, like in West Virginia, you're allowed to drive around in West Virginia for up to 90 days upon entry. Um, weird stuff like that. So all sorts of fun little interesting facts and tidbits in here. Plus looking at, at uh, maps of what was considered an important attraction by AAA back in 1939 is just kind of an interesting uh, deep dive through time. And on that note, I'm going to transition to talking about uh, what other people are saying about these books. And so since I ended on the 1939 AAA, I wanted to read for you a, a couple of snippets from a 1952 um, New York Times article about the golden anniversary of the AAA National Organiza Organization celebrating, oh gosh, hang on, this is back when titles for newspaper articles were ridiculously long. National organization celebrating 50 years of emancipating motorists from mud, speed traps, and legalized derision. Um, it's just so interesting reading this 1952 New York Times article, <clears throat> which was printed um, March 9th, 1952, page double X one. Um, I believe I'm reading that correctly. I'm on an archive for the New York Times. Generally with the older books when I read them, I don't read them a whole lot. I do have a whole old book section. There's not a whole lot of old books in my old book section. Um, and my definition of an old book is um, pre-World War II. Uh, I do have books from the 60s, 50s, and 40s, but I don't consider them in the same category as pre-World War II. Some of the books I have, um, which we'll get to, we will get to, I swear, are from like the 1720s like i have a history of england from like 1720 or whatever um we'll get to that we'll, we'll do a review of that book um probably when i do a review of history books i don't know we'll see um that was a really long tangent and i don't know where it was going uh i believe it was going towards ah uh, yes when i pull up the new york times archive generally i'm hoping the new york times has a review of a book that's older um <clears throat> because obviously there's going to be no Goodreads reviews for a 1939 tour book of the AAA Associate or the American Automobile Association. You know that's not going to be on Goodreads. It's not going to be on Amazon either. Best you're going to find is is it as a copy for sale on eBay. So I'm not going to read to you the whole um, review, but I just want to call out a few quotes here that I just think encapsulate the tone, and I just think it's kind of I don't know. I think it's kind of silly and funny the way they're writing as if like. Um, motorists are discriminated against or something to that effect. They're like, for one of the major reasons for organizing the national body was the need for defensive measures to fight the prejudices against the and restrictions on motor cars and motorists. Um, or this line down here, which is a few paragraphs later, one of the first undertakings of the AAA was to break down the iron curtains between the states Reciprocal privileges for visiting motorists were then an unknown courtesy, and so strong was the provincial frontier idea embedded in fine official minds that for a while the AAA sought to circumvent it by proposing federal registration and a national license plate. So it's just interesting 
reading the history of AAA and how important they were for um, highway, I guess you could say regulation and motor laws and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess perhaps I probably should have bundled this in. I have a few other books uh, that are like I have a, a manual on how to identify traffic um, accidents from like the 1950s for a police officer's manual. I also have a couple of driver instruction manuals from the 1930s that my grandfather got because he got his driver's license and I think like 1934 or 1935, something like that. Um, but we'll have to do an episode on those and maybe I'll, I'll return to the AAA book. Um, so yeah, there's not, not surprisingly in this week talking about atlases, there's not a whole lot of book reviews that I could find about these books. Um, you know, the scholastic Atlas of the world, I thought it was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> this, this review from, it only has, uh, on Amazon. I, I found, uh, very few on Goodreads. Uh, it has 4.1 out of five of 12 global ratings. So, whew, um, a lot, a lot of, uh, reviews there. And this is from, this is a review by Thoroughly Charmed. This has been very useful for the 12-year-old gr grandson's geography work. And as a homeschooler, anything that makes it easier is a winner, dot, dot. Um, that was written in December of 2012. Uh, so, you know, 65% were five-star reviews. I mean, I'm going to give it a two, but that's just because it's outdated. It's 20 years old. Um, and the information you're getting out of this, you probably could get more up-to-date and useful information elsewhere. But I suppose if you want to, you know, give your eyes a rest, it's good for that. Couldn't find anything on the Oxford World Atlas, but I imagine the same kind of sentiments. Um, as for the Cahokia Atlas, I um, found it on uh, Amazon. It has 4.2 out of 5, 4 global ratings, and Uncle Rick, uh, which would be my uncle name if I had any nieces or nephews. Um, at least I jokingly say that. I don't think I'd actually be Uncle Rick. Um, but Uncle Rick, he says five stars, uh, good book, you know, doesn't get more succinct than that, right? You know, short and sweet, beautiful. Uh, then we've also got, let's get back here, it's only got three ratings on Goodreads, it's got a 4.33 out of five stars, so like I said, very few people talking about the Cahokia Atlas, but I definitely think it's an underrated gem for anyone who's interested in archaeology. Um, definitely will not treat you like a novice, though, like if you don't have any background in archaeology, Go listen to my episode about Invita Invitation to Archaeology by D James Dietz. Go read that book. You can find it on, like, you know, Amazon for, like, four or five bucks. And then read that in a, in a day. And then go read the Cahokia Atlas. You'll be better prepared for it. And then now we got to get to the one that has the most apparently controversy, not that it's that much, is The World Atlas by um, John Short. Now, this one, oh, I didn't even actually tell you anything about really any of these authors. Melvin Fowler, the guy who wrote the Cahokia Atlas, is uh, an archaeologist in Illinois State. Um, and then obviously the the Scholastic and the Oxford um, Atlas were written by the publisher, so there's not really any credited author. And uh, same with the AAA book, it's written by AAA. But this is the one that actually has an author, and the author, John Rennie Short, it was born in Scotland in 1969. He's been teaching geography for like 40 years. He's the department chair of geography at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and he's done countless presentations, talks, you know, papers, all that kind of good stuff. But apparently, uh, some people had some issues with this book. So uh, I could read, uh, you know, all of the critical reviews, um, but I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to read a selection. It got a 4.3 out of 5 stars, 10 global ratings, 64% of those are 5 star. Um, this one's a three star, three out of five star by Lyndon Brecht, uh, written February 19th, 2015. Some nice illustrations, weak text, a bit Euro-centered for my taste. Uh, that's the title of the, the review. I found this book to be an entertaining read, not particularly deep. The illustrations are interesting, and the quality is good. The text is not particularly well written, offering bits of interesting information, but not connected well to an overall narrative. This seems to be something of a formula for the from the publisher, a nicely illustrated and rather superficial text. I hope to learn something about maps. That didn't happen. I also wish the book uh, had a wider cultural reach. It isn't just Europeans who made and make maps. Now, this seemed to be a general thread, the idea that the book was a, a bit sparse on information. And 
and there was also another reviewer who like got super critical of like um uh oh man i lost it here where is it um i believe it was also another amazon review yeah this person saying um uh he seems to confuse apianus with munster and can't tell a munster from a shettle and I'm like, okay, bud, are you an art historian here? I looked up the page he was referring to, um, page 109. And yeah, I suppose you could confuse some of the, the captions and might, might be led to infer via omissions that maybe this image is a monster and not a, a shuttle or whoever that is. But I think they're missing the forest through the trees here. The, the people who are critical of this book I'm not sure who they thought the audience was for this book. The book is coffee table sized. It's gigantic. It's, you know, less than 200 something pages. Uh, yeah, it's a total of 224 pages if you count every single page. Um, and I thought it did a decent job. You know, it's like if you're an intro to geography class, you know, I wouldn't say this is the textbook for the class. I would hope that you go beyond what's in this in an intro to geography class. But, you know, if you wanted to make this the first three or four weeks of class reading, I think it does the job perfectly fine. It talks about map projections. It talks about the history of map making. And this critique that um, I don't want to sound like I'm defending it too hard here. I'm getting a little, you can tell in my voice here. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed this book as an educator. I thought it accomplished its goals very well. Uh, I mean, did I think, yes, like one of the sections here, um, I mean, you, you've got the table of contents here, chapter 16, cartographic encounters. This one did seem out of place. It's sort of like they were on a theme here of going from like ancient prehistory up to the present in, in their sort of sequencing. But then it, we sort of take a, a sidestep and go to indigenous maps of sub-Saharan Africa. We talk about maps of Central Asia. I mean, the idea that this was Eurocentric I, I mean, A, that's inherent when we talk about historical records. Um, prehistoric records are mostly archaeological, and so he talks about rock art, which is, I mean, most of his examples, Native North America. He talks about Australia. He has a whole section about how maps can be used as a form of proof for land claims in Australia from colonial oppression. He talks about the implications of propaganda. So, I, you know, I just... The critical reviews for this book, I didn't understand where they were coming from. I don't know what they were looking for. Like, if they were looking for this in-depth textbook on cartography, you know, they clearly ignored all of the other signs that this is not what that book is about. It's, you know, 200 pages. It's coffee table size. It's got the big, bold, pretty pictures. This is not the kind of book that you're going to be walking away saying, ah, yes, you have your master's in geography and I read the world th through maps, and thus we are on equal footing. Uh, you know, I, I just think they're they're being disingenuous with the goal of the book and who the audience is, at least with the critical reviews. So those are just a few reviews that I was able to pull about the books that we're talking about this week. Um, any books that I'm not going to keep, which include the Scholastic uh, Atlas, the Pocket World Atlas, uh, I'm going to put those in the book bin. You can check out the book bin. Uh, there's a link to it in the show notes uh, for this episode. Um, it is a Google Sheet that you can check out and look at all the books that have been reviewed, what I gave the score or what the the um, score for the, the book was or the review score. Why am I struggling so hard with score? I don't know. Um, you can also check out um, if I kept it or not. Uh, you can see publisher information, all that kind of good stuff as well, especially for some of these books that obviously – don't have any reviews on good uh, Goodreads or on Amazon. Um, you know, that's the only source you're gonna have is the book bin. Uh, also, be sure to follow updates and news, not just about the podcast, but anything about archaeology that I'll be doing, um, because I do do field work. I mean, we're getting into the season where I'm gonna start digging, so you'll probably see pictures, updates, uh, maybe some edited videos that will be updated later. You'll hear news about that on the Telegram channel that you can follow if you go to the main page. Um, or if you want to listen to the edited podcast because you like the theme song, um, you can listen to that anywhere you get podcasts um, or go to the anchor.fm channel. So that's going to do it for this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about um, a fiction book. So yay, we're not talking about um, nonfiction, right? Um, I talk about nonfiction a lot. Next week, we'll be talking about Italo Calvino's book, Difficult Loves. And that'll do it for this week. And until then, 
never stop reading.